Ready? Hello and welcome to Rhythm and Pixels, a video game music podcast. This is episode 30-8. And more importantly, this is our 300th episode. <laughs> My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. And we are both 300 years old. And Well, yeah, well, none of the vampire stuff, though. I don't do the blood, mm. and Rob is vegetarian. Yeah. So, I, you know, we're, we're weird 300-year-old <laughs> folks. Maybe, maybe ancient curses, but not so much the vampiric. <sighs> Yeah, um, the, the T virus is keeping us alive, though. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm, stars. Or something. <laughs> Just we, call me Tyrant P. No, no, we're not three hundred years old. Three hundred years old in podcast years is what we are. <laughs> That's a metric now. No, well, we did celebrate our our um, our sixth podcast anniversary, our podcast anniversary, if you will. Um, but what we like to do every big milestone. I think we only did this for our two hundredth episode. Was that we like to go back and listen to music from topics. That we liked already, so we're kind of revisiting old topics with new tracks. With new tracks, just for a little bit of funsies. Um, Pernell, you were just at PAX Unplugged last weekend, mm-hmm. which we're going to be um, getting into a little bit deeper with our next episode. Yes, which I'm really excited about. Which is going to be funny because full disclosure, because I think that adds <laughs> to the laws of the episode oh. proper. So Rob and I agreed to do episode 300 with this topic in mind. We agreed on this like two weeks ago. So Rob put out the bonus beats episode. So we have more time to prepare. I forgot about that. So I picked all the tracks in advance and was ready to go. And then I was like, no, no, we're, we're, we're doing a bonus beats. Remember? I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I forgot. And then this week, she came in I cover with the wrong tracks. Yeah. So these tracks that I'm going to ping up today are the tracks that I tried to recollect yeah. and recall as to what they would have been <laughs> for that episode. So that's extra funny. A, a little bit behind the scenes. I mean, maybe it's a, this is a kind of a retrospective episode about like all the of all the past episodes and guests and, and, and what we've learned throughout the years of doing this show. But a little bit behind the scenes is that we would usually we usually only plan it one episode ahead. We mm-hmm. don't even have extra episodes recorded. We record and then that's that's the episode for the week. Mm-hmm. And we've been doing that for six years. Yeah, and it's amazing like, too because it's like I think other shows, other people would be like, "You're gonna lose it. You're gonna lose it. You're gonna keep going and you're gonna lose it." But like we just, it's like we've hung on. We've hung on to that bike. I will say, I have fallen off the unicycle a few times, but but. I pick it back up, yeah, and I ride again. And Rob's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Don't worry about the skin and knee, man. It's just a little blood." So anyways, I'll get used to it because we always just redo like one in advance, plan one in advance. The fact that we have like the next like four or five planned was probably throwing you for a loop. I think it did. Also, yeah. this I guess it's worth mentioning anyway, just because it's a general state of being is that I just have been weird with memory lately, anyway. And also general exhaustion. So I've been getting a lot of like general tests. And I mentioned this a little bit to you before. Yeah, yeah. You've been getting some tests done just to see what's going on, right? Yeah. And I think there may finally be an answer to that, which is bizarre and also freaky. And apparently they're believing it to be a high level iron deficiency. Oh, so which is strange because you drink so much blood being a vampire. Uh, bleh. <laughs> Maybe I'm drinking anemic blood, so it's not helping. But like the weird thing is that... um. You know, it sparked because I was like, I'm always so tired and my memory's getting weird. I'm always so tired. So the general thought would be, you need to sleep more. You need to sleep more. But I do get mixed bags of like, sometimes I don't get much sleep. Sometimes I get a lot of sleep. Mm-hmm. But no matter how it says, like, something's got to be off. Something's weird. I can't even exercise like I was before COVID had, before the COVID thing kicked in. So I went and they're like, your iron should be like 38. Yours is 26. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh-huh. like, that doesn't make sense. But I also was like, I haven't donated blood in a few months. You know, so. I, I'm really careful about the uh, multivitamins that I take every day. This is old man talk now, <laughs> yeah, um, especially because for the longest time, you know, vegetarian. So um, it's really important to me that I get all the vitamins and minerals that I'm looking for that I wouldn't would not normally get by not eating meat. And iron is one of those things. Iron is one of those things you get through like mainly through like red meat um, and like kale and broccoli and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So unless I eat a ton of kale and broccoli all the time, I'm not going to get it all the time. So when I look for multivitamins, I always look for iron. And if you get like the the man multivitamins, oh god, I, I have those. Or I like hate them multivitamins too. for your brain, it's always like really focused. Half the time, it's not going to have iron. So you want to look for a woman's multivitamin because they get more iron. They get more iron. 
I ended up this time. I got cheap because I was a buy one get one free on a little vitamins. life. A little life hack for you. Oh, I need all the life hacks these days. <laughs> this episode brought to you by Flintstones Vitamins. <laughs> I like chewing them because they're chewables. Um, so I mean, I want to say that I'm really proud of us. I'm really proud of you. I'm really proud of me. I was, going to, I was going to say that, but, you know, I'm proud of you, too. Uh, to get 300 episodes deep. And, and I know our, our feed is like 150 because it doesn't go back that far. And the amount of stuff that we've produced is well over that because of bonus beats and other little side pieces and stuff like that going on in the show. Um, but this is the longest running project that I've ever worked on. Likewise and, here. And I've, I've thought about changing it here and there and evolving it into something else. But the more we do it, the more we just, I just like it. I like this format. It's fun. And yeah. it's interesting also, like, when we see new people, even now, pop into, like, the discourse. Like, hey, I found your show yeah. through XYZ and I like it. And I'm like, we're this long into the tooth and people are still finding the show. I feel like if we stop doing it. Five years from now, people will still be finding still be the show. I know. I would still be paying for hosting <laughs> because people are still going to look for it. Um, yeah. And actually, the Discord is one of those things that I didn't want to do for a while or just didn't even consider doing for a long time. And I'm so glad we have it. I pre- I can't believe I'm saying this, but I genuinely prefer to the Facebook wholeheartedly. I, I like it all. I think a lot of people feel the same way, which is why so many people use Discord these days. Mm-hmm. But don't take our word for it. Um, I was thinking maybe we'd... Sp- sp- put it out throughout the show but we have a few people coming to say hello oh. and thank you to the R&P train well no <laughs> that was that was from the VGM Fight Club we were the um, Rhythm and Pixels Express oh yeah shoot, and shoot. I know and we can retire <laughs> <laughs> all right so here we go we got we got a few people coming by to say hello hey it's the messenger the host of a VGM journey and I want to say congratulations to Robin Purnell for 300 episodes. Hi, guys. It's Ed Wilson from the VG Embassy, your podcast dad. I just wanted to say I'm so proud of you both for recording 300 episodes of Rhythm and Pixels. I remember that one drunken night of passion I had with that Sega Genesis sound chip, and 32 bits later, two slimy babies were born. The first one, Purnell, grew up to be very tall and to talk like he's 50 years old, but act like he's 12. And the other, Rob, grew up to think like he's 50 years old, but looks like he's 12. I'm still not sure how you've managed to record for 300 episodes and remain best friends, because it didn't work out that well for me. Maybe it's all the hop tea you've been drinking. Or the slurm. Or maybe malk now with vitamin F. In any case, whether you're talking about Steve Urkel way too much, trying to convince people how much fun stepping on DDR arrows is, guzzling hot sauce until your tongue bleeds, or trying to marry Falcom, I will be one of your biggest fans and greatest supporters. Love you guys. Keep it up. Let's hear another 300 episodes. Hello from XVGM Radio. This is Mike. And this is Justin. We wanted to congratulate you guys on six years of VGM podcasting. 300 episodes? That is so, so much. Uh, I don't know how you guys do it. Each and every week you're putting out crazy awesome content. It's been a pleasure being on your show. It's been such a pleasure having you guys on our show. We love you guys to death. We wish you many more years of successful podcasting. And again, thank you for all you do. And congrats on this amazing milestone. Congrats again, guys. Hello, Rob and Purnell. This is Michael calling from the northeast of England. And I'm very happy to be able to call myself a stalwart listener of Rhythm and Pixels. I've been enjoying the podcast from quite near the start, and it's been such a joy for me to check in on it week after week. I feel very lucky to have gotten to know you both a bit over the last few years, as you're both fantastic lads with shrewd ears and good-humoured voices. So congratulations on the 300th episode. What an amazing achievement that is. Take care, and talk to you again very soon. Rob, Purnell, Hammock here, KVGM, The Last Wave, smoothest half hour of video game music on the planet. Now, Little Birdie told me that Rhythm and Pixels is celebrating 300 episodes. 300, wow, 300 
100 is a lot. 200 is twice as much. I mean, when I hit 200 episodes, I'm retiring, I'm out of the game, see ya. But 300, that's incredible, wow, congratulations, I'm so proud of you both. And look, all you need to do is 65 more episodes, and then there will be a Rhythm and Pixels episode for each day of the year. 66 if you want to cover leap years. But seriously, congratulations on reaching 300 episodes. You guys are the best. I love jamming out with you each week. I can't wait for Sitcom Jams 2, The Reunion. Your friendship is what makes Rhythm and Pixels so special. Every week is a doctor-recommended dose of that vitamin D sunshine. And I would know, because I am a doctor. I've got a PhD in jamming out. Rob, Purnell, I salute you. Here's to another 300 episodes. Here's to 600. And then, all you'll need to do is another 66 episodes after that. And you'll bring about the apocalypse. <laughs> Talk about even more fun for the whole family. Adios, muchachos. <laughs> It'd be a rhythm and po- rhythm apocalypse. That's too good. Oh my gosh! Thank you, everybody, for sending those into us. It's really appreciated. That was great. And hilarious. Oh man! So now we have we have Doctor Bridgewater and. Dr. Hammer. Dr. Hammer. Dr. <laughs> Hammer. Actually, I'm sorry. He's a doctor. It's like a doc, doc, Dr. Hammock. Dr. Hammock? Dr. Doctor. 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 <laughs> they have a conversation. It's like, doctor, doctor. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. That was so, so good. Um, Ed's really cracked me up. I had no idea where that was going to go. He's a good guy. And we need to get, just like how Hammock said he needs to get back on for mm-hmm. sitcom jams. We need to yeah. get, we still need to get him, um, Ed back on for the Supernatural Super send off. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the show's been off the air for a while. Almost a year, but yeah. say, it's never too late. I know. I still haven't finished watching it. Exactly. So it counts. I mean, okay, I'll finish Persona, but I don't think I'm going to finish Supernatural. I already gave you the easy out. Just listen to the la- Just watch the last, like, either last season or the last half of the last season. Uh, I might do that. Because I feel like the last season's also better in that it already knows it's winding down at that point. Mm-hmm. So it just kind of says, hey... Here are some episodes that lean in towards like a like a, a climactic finale. Uh, I got you, but you know what though, I might I might get into that later because of I don't know why. Sometimes I just find a show and I just fall into. It. I'm we're gonna rewatch The Witcher. Oh, God, I haven't even started The it's Witcher. Good, it's good stuff. Um, but yeah, I, and I love hammocks. I love the idea that we can bring about the apocalypse with our podcast. <laughs> I don't know how possible that is, but we go for well, it. Well, <laughs> there is a way. We can take, <laughs> once we hit the halfway point, we can just take all of our previous episodes and play them backwards. Oh. Actually, if you play this episode backwards, it'll just sound backwards. But <laughs> but it also has a nice recipe for a nice bouillabaisse. <laughs> That's right. You can make a clean soup with it. Mm-hmm. Clean soup. I don't know why I said clean soup. Because I just had clean soup today. I posted a picture of having 32 ounces of uh, delicious soup that costs way too much money. Oh. Okay. Um, I tried the pho place um, in Fairfax. You, you would like it. Oh, really? Yeah, very good stuff. Time to go. Then. I'm going to make out. it happen. Good broth. Actually, I saved a bunch of extra broth. <laughs> I'm going to make and I'm going to make some more with that broth. It's really, really good. Okay, so let's get started with some music here. Um, this is thirty eight. So I'm starting us off. I'm going to pick from episode twenty two one. This is the Stank Face Jams with Cameron Childs, who is Bruce Irons. From the Mad Gear Band, oh, yeah. who are on the on the road again, I believe they're touring. Not, I don't know if they're touring, but they're playing again. I'm sure they're all very excited to be at their instruments, melting faces, um, and destroying pants. <laughs> <laughs> you just stored a bunch of pants. Store. I think Cameron would appreciate that um, with his it, Mario Party <laughs> reference earlier today. It's one of my favorite episodes um, with one of my favorite guests. One of my favorite, like, just musically, it was fun. Which is like, who's got the stankiest music ever? So, this is from the game. It's actually this this game I picked from actually has the stankiest name. It's Manx TT Superbike. <laughs> it's a, it's a bicycle. It's a, it's a motorbike racing game. Manx TT Superbike for the Sega Saturn. The composer is unknown and is uncredited. This is track number seven.
we're back. You're rocking out to track seven from the game Manx TT Superbike for the Sega Saturn. Track seven, the artist is unknown, it's uncredited. Um, I looked everywhere. There's nothing on the VGM database online. There's nothing on, on Google Wiki. There's nothing on YouTube. And um, I even I even looked for a long, the last ditch effort. You look for a long play of the game, skip to the end during the credits, and hope it's in English. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And, and no sound, no sound designer, no sound production. No bun that. bun? No bun bun. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. Which always kills me because this is really good. Well, I'm, I guess I the, the track is it. fun, but then that keyboard solo comes in, and I'm like, "Ooh, yeah!" So give me the skimmy on this game that you came across. What is this? It's it's an early 3D. It's a Sega. It's an early Sega Saturn game. Like it's like the Sega Sports branded title, mm-hmm. um, and it's a super bike game where you're just racing super bikes. Um, but there's a lot of um, FMV, like full motion video, interspersed. So if you win the race, you get like. Um, Essentially, like dash cam footage of people like actually racing super bikes, which oh. I'm sure if you're really into that stuff, it's awesome. Oh yeah! For me, I'm here for the jams, <laughs> <laughs> and I like it because it's it's a good mix of like really clean sounding keyboards and like really crunchy sounding drums and like a really terrible guitar sample in the background. And this actually really makes me appreciate that this existed at all because I can tell you right now, like over the last few years. I get access. I end up doing reviews like almost. I almost say against my will because I always accept them. <laughs> it's true. But it's not. It's not something that I request so much as like, hey, this came, this code came through. Do you want to do it? I'm like, sure. Why not? And it ends up being these super bike games, like these modern super bike games. But they're always silent when you're racing. Yes. Like it's. I guess there's like this contingent of people that are just like, all we want is to hear the engine purring, <laughs> and I want to hear my scabs yeah. forming as I roll across the pavement when I fall off my bike as I'm going to do because these things are pain to drive. Um, I want this. If this was in those games, I'd be more inclined to suffer through the fails to succeed and become better at the games. Yeah, right. Uh, it's much more exciting that way. Uh, Forza Horizon on um, on Xbox and on the PC is is got like a it's got like multiple soundtracks. Essentially, they went out to um, it's, it's a car racing game, but it's like a kind of an open world car racing game, and they, they and they've really expanded on that. And I really want to play it. It sounds awesome. It was Joe from SML. That was his game of the year. Um, oh, really? Yeah. But like, what they did was they went out to different like um, like electronic music and rock labels and said, "Give us like a playlist," and then that becomes the soundtrack for the game. So there's there's a country music playlist. There's a classical music playlist. So it's one of those games where like you can like change music. the car's radio station. I think, and that's I the think playlist. so. Yeah, and I'm really into it because um, my favorite drum and bass label, Hospital, has been doing soundtracks to the game for the past like four or five years. Mm-hmm. And every soundtrack, I just buy the soundtrack. I don't nice. know the game. The soundtrack's always so good. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm really, really into that. But I remember with Gran Turismo. What was the one that came out? Gran Turismo that came out on the PlayStation 2. Gran Turismo. Actually, that, on the PS2, it's Gran Turismo 3. There's 3. Gran so Turismo when that 3. got released, it was a big... I remember reading a whole layout in like some like EGM or something magazine about how, like, oh, it's going to be... They, they, they researched all the cars and how they handle and it's going to be super lifelike they even like got microphones under the hood so that they made sure that all of the cars sounded as authentic as possible to the individual engines and i'm like i'm not gonna that's not gonna like i'm, I'm not gonna hear the difference <laughs> everything just sounds like the same like <laughs> but but you just know there's that one ge- well i say I'll, I'll say there was more than one there's gotta be a couple oh, I'm sure there's gotta one. be a bunch of gear here listen just like Oh my god, listen to that engine purr. <laughs> now I'm going to tweak this setting by 0. 0.5 yeah. decibels. Oh my god, it sounds so amazing. Uh, and also, I, it may like I'm yeah. teasing, but no. I'm fairly confident that's exactly how, because that's how I am when I talk about board game bits. Like, oh man, I got these wooden bobbles and shit like a drumstick. It's fantastic. Like, I get it. Yeah, yeah, you get, you get into the, the minutia of it. But also, like, I'm not going to hear the engine because I want to hear the music that's playing during the game. And I think the, game, the music in Gran Turismo 3 was licensed. I remember the only track I really liked from that was that like kind of punk pop punk version of 99 Luft Balloons. Oh yes. You remember you know what I'm talking about? I know I love 99 Luft Balloons. But there's like a pop punk version of it. I can't remember who uh, did it. The thing about it is like I'm, mine's been overwritten because I do karaoke and one of the things I do at karaoke is like a sort of like metal punk version oh, it was of Gold- 99 Luft Balloons. <laughs> oh, no, it was Goldfinger. Oh, okay. I yeah, probably yeah. have heard that before. Goldfinger, that was a ska group, right? Mm, that's no Goldfinger. I don't know what type of music was they played, but I know of the band. Goldfinger, the band. Yeah, yeah they were a band. Better than Monkey Finger. Punk, monkey punk rock and ska. Okay, so yeah, very like early 2000s. <laughs> hey, I can't knock it. I was actually looking up something today 
probably because of next week's topic, but also because I got nostalgic. The LST from um, SSX3, because apparently oh, I yeah. want to play that again. I thought that was tricky, right? No, 3. 3 was so SSX, and right. SSX tricky, even though they consider that to be 2, it was really just like the tracks from the first game with a few added, and then like more voices. Yeah. That was tricky. And SSX3 was an actual sequel where it was like a living mountain, and you could like choose a spot on the mountain to start oh, for a race and you shot down. Oh, that's right. It was yeah, a really yeah. cool game. They had blizzards and stuff. Let's get into the next track, but let's keep talking about SSX. Okay. So <laughs> I like that game. So my next track, this one was an easy recover, mental recovery. I don't know how it was, but it came back to me um, immediately. What? So this came, this is related to episode 26-9, TGIF versus Capcom, because Ooh. of course I'm going to revisit that. Absolutely. Um, and I'll get into the why shortly, but the track title is Teasel versus Glide Loth from the game The Misadventures of Tron Bond for the PlayStation 1, composed by Toshihiko Horiyama. Welcome back. You're listening to Teasel vs. Glide, Loath, from the game Misadventures of Tron Bond for the Sony PS1, composed by Toshihiko Horiyama. So this game is one of those like PS1 holy grail games from the collector's market. It sells for a stupid amount of money. Um, I'm thankful that I actually bought it on discount when it was like new, because like Tron Bond, she's an awesome character. Um, she originated in the Mega Man Legends series, which is also... That's also a rare game now, right? Yep. Mega Man Legends 2 spe- especially, but Mega Man Legends 1 is also surprisingly rare. Mm. Um, it was like the... I think it was probably, aside from the abysmal Mega Man X7, it was like the only 3D4 aim of Mega Mans. I wish they'd revisit that. Heck, I wish they'd make another Mega Man game. But I digress. Um, so, this track... It's interesting. The entire OST of this game is fairly short loops like this. It's amazing that they could pull that off. But... It works because people seem to go online. You talk about online, people are like, oh, I'd love the OST for Misadventures of Tron Bunk. Oh, but they're all, like, short. Yeah, they're all very huh. short tracks that just loop throughout stages and stuff. It's a surprise to me. Hmm. Um, but it is a good OST despite, or I don't want to say despite that, but, you know, in regards to that, it's a very nice it, OST. Is the gameplay of Tron Bond similar to the Mega Man Legends game? Not exactly, and that's going to lead into why I picked this track for this topic. So... I chose this for the TGIF versus Capcom because I had another match in mind that I wish I brought up on the original episode, but now I got it. So this is going to be from a show that most people do not remember anymore. The matchup is Tron Bond versus Coach Lubbock from the show Just the Ten of Us, which had a very brief stint on the TGIF lineup Friday nights. That's right. So Tron Bond, her element is she is a pirate who works with her family, the Bond family, to rob ruins and also banks for great great loot they use it to you know pay for their airship and also you know to live off of and tron's main methods of activity are twofold one her my, her mech that she polishes is a multifaceted mech she's a great inventor um but the other thing that she has or little things are her serve bot army yes. who she commands to do what she needs to have done and they all have such fantastically glowing personalities they speak like children. Hi, Miss Bartrand. I love it. It's fantastic. Now, her opponent is Coach Lubbock. He is a man who is a teacher, so he's also intellectual. He is a sports coach. So he's got fitness going on, sort of, because he was a comic who had a little bit of a chub thing going on. But still, he was a coach. And he has eight children. <laughs> he has his own little mini army that he can command to do things 
with the right amount of allowance money to do his bidding. So it's his sitcom family versus an army of tiny robots. Little ro- Lego robot people. Because oh. that's not the serve boss. Or they're all like little Lego yeah, men. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if, if I'm the same as a lot of people, but I only really know of Trombon. I, I knew tangentially that she was related to the Mega Man Legends series, but then I know her mainly from Marvel vs. Capcom 2 because mm-hmm. Servbot was unlockable. Yes. And like the only thing good about Servbot was having the super. Um, and that's the only thing that made was it Was the super the growing or did he also have lunch rush? No, he grew and he did lunch rush. Oh, okay. And, and that's the only thing that made him better than Roll in that game. Roll was Roll was just Roll. Yeah, Roll's only value is her hitbox. Yeah, she's super tiny. Um, and, and also, and then they brought her into Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and she was really good in 3. Like, oh, they fixed her up. Yeah, her throw, and she has like um, a super throw, like a super move throw that would like that had like no hitbox, so no one could hit her while she was doing stuff. It's kind of funny to realize that Roll's been in three fighting games at least, because she was also in uh, Tatsunoku versus Capcom. Yeah, a fan favorite for mm-hmm. some reason. <laughs> hey, you know, Sentai characters, you can be gotcha men. There was a live action Mega Man, fan made Mega Man show on YouTube. Remember that? Really? It was pretty good. I wonder if I've seen it and just it, forgot it about it. It was homemade. Like, the guy who played Wily was, like, way into his role. And I would say that it would have been a great show all around if it wasn't for the actor who played Roll. <laughs> Poor thing. Not really into it. Kind of, kind of over the top. He's like, they paid me to do this. I feel like. But the rest was great. Um, it, it reminded me a bit of, um, do you remember, um, uh, what's it called? No, I don't remember what's it called. That was a is that a uh, cool show? It was on Nickelodeon? Rocket Jump. You know Rocket Jump? Was that that Nickelodeon? No, I'm thinking about Rocket. No, Rocket something. No, if I don't a, remember it Rocket. Was a, it was a YouTube guy, but he did. Um, he essentially did like short like videos and short shows, but then he eventually spun off and did like longer series. Series? 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 Series. But he was really good at doing um, special effects on a low budget. Like really good computer effects on a super low budget. Oh, okay, and so it kind of reminded me of that, like that the budget of that show, and it was just like like really good act. Not like it was decent acting with with really good effects, and just like everyone was like super invested in making a good Mega Man show. So when I saw that Netflix is to, is planning on doing a Mega Man live action, I'm thinking, you know, what? it Go can for- work. It that can, can actually work, it especially can, because it's a movie, work, yeah. and not a TV show. I mean, if it was a TV show, I'd be worried. If it was, if it was a limited series, if it was like four or five episodes, I'd say nice. But if they were like, we're going to spin this off into a long thing, I'm going to be like, no, Cowboy Bebop out of here. Yeah, get the <laughs> Cowboy Bop out. Also, I did remember it was Nickelodeon Rocket Power. Rocket Power. That's what you're thinking of, yeah. And I only know of that show because I sold the toys and video games. I, I never watched it in my life. Uh, the other, uh, the, the show that. The guy from Rocket Jump spun off into something larger was Video Games High School. Which Wait, was video game. Okay, I think I'm, I'm sure. I'm yeah. remember that because it's not like a fighting game. High school it was video game high school, but they yeah. did fight in school. Yeah, they did. It was like it was like instead of like football, there was first person shooters, and instead of band camp, it was like people playing rhythm games. As it should. It be. was like if if the future was just video games were everywhere. And it was actually I I thought it was really well written. It was really funny. It had some some. It kind of fell apart towards the end. Um, but I really enjoyed that. And actually, the, the lead uh, character in that show, and I think it's the same guy, he also does the, the Twitter that, that does all of the fake Saturn games. There's a Twitter that does fake Saturn I'm games? I'm sure you've seen this, where it's like um, where it's like Grimace, the Saturn game, and he does like... He, he makes, I've never seen he this. Make, yeah, it's, it, he did this like he did this like every day or every week for like years of just making like really silly fake Saturn games, and it's the same guy. But is it actually like gameplay footage that he somehow creates? No, or? no, no. It's just the covers. Okay, the covers I've heard of. I just didn't know it was a YouTube thing. No, too. no, no. It was a Twitter thing. Was oh, a Twitter, Twitter thing. thing. Okay, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. I've seen. Yeah, yeah I love so those. I think that's the same the same lead actor that was in Video Games High School. He was really good. I, I I really enjoyed that show when it was on. Again, the ending, eh. But like it was, it was fun. Sometimes was fun. Rob is about the journey, not so much the destination. Though I have to agree. I have to agree. Especially, I I don't know if it's on Netflix anymore. I watched it on YouTube, and um, ages ago. And I gotta say though, there's yeah. also we why living, like we were living at the condo, and I think it's before before we like did our floors. So and that's also got me thinking too. Like this comes up a lot. Like the I don't know why it's the journey, not the destination. But the idea, like when people watch a show and they're enjoying it and loving the show, and they're like, oh, da 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 da. And they get to the end, and they either didn't like the ending or someone spoiled something big, right? Mm-hmm. It always throws me for a loop because, while I'll admit, I have seen some endings where I'm like, man, that was bone dander. That was hot buttered garbage. But 
I don't hate the journey any it's not less. Take away from it. the fact that you know what I really didn't like the new Cowboy Bebop live action show. It doesn't take away that that the, the time I spent loving the original animated series. It's still there. Yeah, still great. And let's say you hated the ending of Cowboy Bebop. Let's say you hated that last yeah. episode, which I'm sure some people honestly did. Did you hate the episodes that got you there? Absolutely not. Absolutely. I was about not. to give you a finish that <laughs> statement because that'd be crazy talk. <laughs> All right, let's move on to my next track here. We're going into this one. I fell down a deep rabbit hole on. I was telling Pernell about this. Um, I'm going. I'm looking at 25-10 obscurities with Chris Taylor, or could also be 27-3 deep cuts with Nick Marinelli. <laughs> um, this one is called "Burn Up the Space." Yeah, I'm gonna go with this. "Burn Up the Space" from Galaxian Cubed or Galaxian Three Project Dragoon. This is composed by Shinji Hisoe and Ayako Sasso. Um, I don't know which composer composed this track. It does sound like Shinji Hisoe, but um, time will tell. But, uh, composer composing what? Your here we go. Burn Up Space from Galaxian Cubed. I hate to turn this track down for now. I hate to turn this down so much. It pains me to pull that lever down. Well, this is a bopper. Pull down that fader, I mean. Um, yeah, so this is from the game Galaxian Galaxian Cubed Project Dragoon. It's a Namco jam. Um, this one was composed by either uh, Shinji Hisoe or Ayako Sasso. Again, I think it's Shinji Hisoe because that bass and those, those chords are so good. So 80s. Love it. Um, wait it, wait it. So I was originally looking for a game that I played in the arcades um, at, the, at the beach on the boardwalk that was like kind of 3D, used all these crazy mirrors. It was kind of a rail shooter. It was called Starblade, as I found it. Okay. The soundtrack was cool. It was all right. But when I went to look for the soundtrack, it was um, packaged with the SST band. Is it SST? Is that Namco, right? Honestly, you're asking the wrong guy because my brain <laughs> SS, um, SSX or that one band, uh, the, the remix or SST or... Well, S- yeah, SST, the SST band, I think, was like the in-house band. Anyway, um, it was like a, it was a packaged um, uh, soundtrack that was released in Japan, and it was Starblade, and then Galaxian Three Project Dragoon. And I was like, "What the heck is Galaxian Cube?" I know Galaxian. Galaxian was an older style Namco game from way back in the day. Mm-hmm. So I look this thing up, and it is nuts. So first of all, the soundtrack is killer. It's all killer. And it sounds amazing. It's, this right, whole yeah, SSI on the case. SSI on the case. He says it's killer. It's killer. Yeah, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get the fuzz in on this. <laughs> this, this one. I had to. I'm sorry. This track is dropping bodies left and right for now. <laughs> I think, um, I, th- I think we got. I think it's time to bring in the feds on this one. I'm really. I've gotten it's really. In. And by the way, I wasn't wrong. I had to look it up to confirm. Um. Actually, no, this is you. You were correct. SST Band is the Sega's official in-house band. Oh, that band. was Sega. Sega. I'm sorry. Um, and this is not Sega. All right. So anyway, womp, womp. Galaxian Cube Project Dragoon, um, it was almost an arms race between Namco and Sega to make the largest arcade game possible. Okay. So what they did was they, they wanted to make the largest, biggest video game in the world. So they it was going to be for an amusement park in Japan. Okay. It was a gigantic gigantic cylindrical room with a huge plexiglass screen in the middle. The game ran off of laser discs, which is why the music is such high quality sounding. Um, and then there were 26 <laughs> places for people to sit around the circle facing inwards on the screen. 
each, every one with like kind of like a, their own little gun to shoot at the screen. And it was all about like they were all part of this gigantic spaceship called the Dragoon. And it was like flying through space, shooting down asteroids and stuff. And so everyone like played it at the same time. It looks really cool. Only thing I can imagine is like when your score is not high enough, who do you blame? I, I mean, you have 25 people to blame. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people to look at. I was like, man, why are you so bad at this? So on top of this this whole thing being in this giant cylinder, there's the sound is surrounding you from all different ways. It's It was designed to be like like completely sub, like immersive. Mm-hmm. It's not submersive, but immersive. Um, and the whole thing moved on a track. So as you were sitting down, you were you were flying around in circles at the screen as it was spinning around and you were shooting. And it sounds amazing. And then they eventually made a smaller 16 version, 16 player version of the game. And then they released a six player version of the game to different arcades. So it was still like you had to like walk in like behind like um like a like a like a. Uh, a door? A, not over the door. You know what I'm talking a about. A curtain? A curtain. Oh, my God. The, the word curtain. I couldn't think of the Apparently word Apparently, my memory issues are rubbing off on you. Yeah. So, you, yeah, you go behind a curtain, and instead of like it being like in a huge cylindrical track, it's like a large, essentially like kind of half moon shaped uh, half circle of six players. And it was still enormous, still the same game. And I think they released um, maybe slight different variations to improve on the graphics. But, like, it was so big that they couldn't do anything else with it. And apparently, parts of this game, like once the arcades closed down, it was like sold off. It was either broken up into parts. The parts were sold off to other places to do other stuff with it. Mm -hmm. But there's a video game museum in Japan that still has the original. uh, Either they had the original 26-player one or they have like the last remaining six-player one. They just keep it in the parking lot? I don't know. They keep it in the museum like so you can still play it. But like otherwise, this thing would have been sold off and like gone forever. So I'm that, actually glad they maintain that then because I feel yeah. like video game museums are something that we need more of here. I only know about the one that my friend Brendan's trying to maintain in yeah. Baltimore called the Bloop Museum, mm-hmm. but I've never actually been able to get down there to check it out specifically, I so mean, I don't know what the what it's like. I would argue that Galloping Ghosts is a museum. Oh, 100%. Yeah. A, arcade museum specifically. Yeah. And I love them for it. Uh, but yeah, but like stuff like this, like even like in these types of museums, it would be so expensive to like preserve and to hang on to, which makes me so thankful that Namco and Sega and all these other companies at Konami released official soundtracks back in the 90s when in America no one cared you know mm-hmm. we didn't think about it you know I was buying Guns N' Roses on a, on a cassette tape the day I learned about um, our video game on V um, OSTs was an amazing one like I went to like my first anime convention yeah. and the dealer's room just had like rows of OSTs and CD like what is this I why assume, is that not happening here I know I'm looking at all these like soundtracks I just assumed they were um, they were rips or they were like there well, some were bootlegs. Some were bootlegs, like, bootlegs but you for didn't sure. realize yeah. it. <laughs> like, I, when I my first anime con, I walked out of it with like nine or ten like OSTs, and of those, I'd say maybe three of them were bootlegs. But they were also hyper pricey. Like, I think the Valkyrie profile one cost me like fifty bucks because you know they're like, well, it's import, so it cost us apparently forty dollars to ship it overseas, which was a crock. But you know, I bought it. I was a kid. Well, you know, you, you get convention prices. That's what happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, totally. So um, after this was after this game came out, um, this gigantic, enormous um, uh, um, attraction that that Namco made, Sega did their own thing, and they called it like the Super Sphere or something like that. And it was like ten people, and it was enormous. And that thing is gone forever. There's mm-hmm. like there's like nothing about it anywhere anymore. So it's all it remains in the hearts of those who had the chance. To uh, there was like there's like some pictures of it, and then there's. Um, there's like, like even the ROMs they were never dumped like no one got no one can get a hold of anything from this game there's just like photos of it and there's like records of it and then like that's it we just need to find the one Sega yeah. super fan because you know he's got it but Maybe he ain't talking and his name is Electric Boogaloo <laughs> hey I'm not gonna put it past him he's probably got something in that bag of tricks of his he's able to find some stuff uh, I'm sure he's listening to this and being like oh I know all about that <laughs> <laughs> which I would love to know more about because reading about that falling into the rabbit hole of this of this game and this whole system was fascinating to me and then of course it didn't hurt that I could listen to the soundtrack while I was reading about it mm-hmm. so yeah, I love that slap bass man <laughs> yeah what's your next track all right, so this one's pretty funny because in my sense of attempted recollection, I could remember the track, but I couldn't remember what episode I was basing it off of. So in a mad dash of, you know, deep diving, I believe this episode is a one that I would like to talk about because I love the topic <laughs> and it's also one that I think would fit. So I'm going to go with it. So... 
This is in relation to episode 22-2, Superfund. Uh, oh, yeah. And the track that I'm using for that is the track title Resistance from the game Nowhere Profit, from, composed by Mike Beaton. Welcome back. You're listening to Resistance from the game Nowhere Profit. I've played it on the Nintendo Switch, but it's probably on Steam too. Composed by Mike Beaton. And I thought about this in reference to the episode Super Fun because, well, Super Fun refers to, you know, generally like toxic waste cleanup sites mm-hmm. and envir- basically ties it back into like environmental disorder and climate change, and just like the death of the planet. So Nowhere Profit takes place in like in a wasteland environment where you're traveling across the wasteland and you're dealing with marauders and bandits and the like, you know, that world that we don't want to see happen in like 30 years from now. Uh, so the idea behind like this game, and it's mm-hmm. interesting that it came up because in addition to like around the same week that this episode was really being you know prepared for, um, Nintendo released its uh, year in Switch report, which is essentially game, your favorite games for the year and stuff like that. And it just goes to show you that I could totally just start picking tracks only from Twitch games if I finally started playing them because my kickback was I've only played 351 actual hours on the Switch, but according to the Switch, I've played 101 games on it, just on the Switch. So factor in that, I think that also includes games that I might have bought and then maybe booted up once and be like, hey, it works, and then kicked it back because there's no way in heck I've played 101 games for 351 hours. It's like an hour a game. Um, or two hours a game, or well, three hours it a was, game. I like looking at Chris Murray's. Um, uh, he posted his a Switch in review, and it was like he played 200 hours this past year. I'm like, oh, that's cool. 190 of it was Hades. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that sounds right. That'd yeah, be, Hades is a wild. That one. would be like me. I was like, oh yeah, I, I played. You know, maybe 
No, I know how much I played. Because I have like almost 90 hours in Persona 5. That's how much video games I've played this year. <laughs> you played 90 hours this year, and 90 of them were in Persona 5. That's good, because it's a great game at least to spend <laughs> your time in. Yeah. But like, it's just astounding how many hours that we end up putting into games, which I'm not complaining about. Video games are cool. But I think I was blown, mind blown when I came across a friend who played Animal Crossing for 1,513 <laughs> hours. Oh, they left that thing on when they were sleeping. Come on. No. They were they were asleep you and their figure. animal was crossing the an- animals. Well, you figure the way that game works, if you're, a, if you're a major fan of Animal Crossing, you likely log into it every day for at least two hours mm. to engage in talking to your residents yeah. and do your base tasks. So, if there's ever an event in the game, you're going to spend more time doing the actual event if you're actually pursuing a functional goal. In addition to talking to your residents for the day and right. doing your base events, you're going to spend more time it. to do that stuff. Mm-hmm. So, and then, heaven forbid, you're the guy who was like me, who is stuck in his basement in his massive house that he built just organizing <laughs> junk that he couldn't find a place for, but also didn't want to no, get rid true. of. That's true. Like, like those mobile games like that I played a whole lot of. Like, it's just like an hour here or there, but like it's every day. Mm-hmm. Until until I'm like I'm, I'm really annoyed with it, but that's what I did with uh, Cafe Faristas, the cat cafe, <laughs> cafe game. game. I was like I was just so obsessed with trying to make my cafe have the most cats that I loved. Well, that's the way it goes. I mean, that's attracting them to the customers that I only want, only the customers I want. But it's amazing. <laughs> like if those games tracked how much time we spent doing this stuff. Yeah. Like I used to, the last mobile I, I game I played was a uh, uh, Final Fantasy Record Keeper, which mm-hmm. was year a uh, correction between that and that one we don't talk about the freaking Cartoon Network Michelin. Yeah, and uh, cool. and uh, I put a lot of time into both of those games and if it was being tracked I'd probably sob into a bowl of soup like it was yeah. a lot of time you know what I got back into was Picross Picross is great I love Picross There's, there is a uh, Konami like throwback retro Picross game on the Apple on iOS and so it plays like classic Konami music and like all of the pictures that you that you puzzle together are from classic Konami games. And it's really good, mm-hmm. and it's it's been like I used to play a lot of Sudoku for stress relief, mm-hmm. especially on like airplane flight, like flying. And I do that now with Picross. It's really good. Picross is crack. Listener, if she's tough on a to small the screen though. But I, I love Picross. Like our friend, like the show listener Leslie, she is like. To me, to my understanding, she's like the biggest Picross fan I know. Like, she's the person where I'm like, hey, what is this game you're playing? She's like, oh, I'm playing Picross S4. I beat S2 and S3 and S1, and I played through Super Picross, and I played through Mar- I found Mario's Pick. Like, she plays yeah, I, so I, I, much I'm, Picross. I'm thinking about going and finding, like, the, the classic, like, SNES, like, the old or the Super Famicom Picross games that came out. So, I want to. Did they come out in North America? Picross for Super Nintendo? Not to my knowledge, because I. Oh, the, our first Picross was Mario's Picross on the Game Boy. Yeah. And then after that, we didn't get another Picross until the DS got a Picross game. Uh, and then Picross 3D came out. And then once the downloadable games kicked in, every freaking Picross yeah. that came out since Well, the then. DS. The DS is probably like, the perfect. Like Picross, like system. Oh, it's a glorious! Like I love it on there. I play Picross on there, and there's also Pixel Links on the Switch and stuff, which is a fantastic like twist to the concept. I, I had no idea I was going to get into that puzzle game. I didn't even know how it worked. Then once I started playing, I was like, I was like Minesweeper. And I'm but like, it's gonna, relaxing. It's so relaxing. It's challenging, but like it's challenging, just challenging enough. Exactly, you know, which is great. Even when it gets like really hard, it's like it's just hard enough. And I prefer things like Sudoku because. You're still doing that whole process of elimination thing, but at the end you're re- you're rewarded with a cool picture. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, not just like a, a row of numbers. <laughs> exactly. Congratulations. Um, that's a lot of ones and nines. On that same tip, I'm gonna play uh, music from a game that I love. That was all about challenging puzzles, but at a relaxing time. This Super is- Pick Girl. No, <laughs> this is all the way back in episode 16-7 when we had a special guest, the Magical Time Bean. Yes, Ian Stalker on the show. Um, this is from the game Escape Goat 2. I can't believe I haven't played this track yet. The track is called Restoration, composed by Ian Stalker, the magical time being.
Oh, love this music. You're listening to the track Restoration from the game Escape Goat 2, composed by Ian Stalker, the magical time being. I keep calling him the magical time being. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, there could be only one. <laughs> uh, he goes by, or I guess his, his pseudonym is Magical Time Being. But um, yeah, he created the game. He designed com- and composed the music. Um, and it's just one of my favorite games ever, I think. I love the way it looks. I love the way it sounds. It has such a unique sound to it. It sounds it sounds retro, but it's not. You know, it sounds like at a certain place in time, like it was going to, like maybe you hear this music like on the 3DO or, or some Amiga game, but it's so clear and crisp and the bass is so nice. And it's got some kind of quality to it that's perfect for a puzzle game. Yes. I, I don't know. I don't even know how to explain it. Like, I just, I, this is the type of music that I want for a puzzle game. It's funny because it kind of counteracts the frustration of a failed puzzle. Yeah. Like, in, in, in this game, like, you can mess it up and just keep trying it over and over and over and over again. And it's just, you just kind of fall into a rhythm of, like, okay, I tried this. Nah, I'll try that. Nah. Because this game, like, you can puzzle it out yourself and take the time and, like, plan your moves and figure out what to do next. Or you could just try every combination possible and just, just do it. But one thing I will say that's unique about this game and the way it's structured is as the goat is trying to get to the level, there are objects that slide around and things change when you hit switches and all. But unlike a lot of other games where this occurs, there are, I would say, like pathways that are etched into the walls Mm -hmm. that show where the blocks are going to move. So it's never the equivalent of like a Mega Man disappearing block puzzle Right. where you have to remember the sequence. It's like, no, here's the literal path it's going to take. All you have to remember is that this switch activates that block. Yes. Yeah, but there are there are sections where, like, I guess some blades pop out and, like, fly around the screen. You have to remember where they're going to be. But that's still the same, almost the same logic. It's the remembering oh, the oh. origin point, not so much the tr- the pathway and yeah, the trajectory. It's not, not going to disappear and, like, reappear somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um I don't know, man. But I, I, I played through every bit of this game. And then I, once I learned that there were hidden levels in this game, I went back to try to find them. Because there, there were because it's essentially like a block puzzle game. You're moving blocks out of the way to find the exit. And there are and a few of the stages, there's alternate ways to solve the puzzle that will open up a different exit. And I had no idea. And I went back to, and I was like, I looked at some YouTube videos. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And it's double interesting that that so existed because unlike a lot of other games that do like puzzle platform, like you don't unlock new abilities in the scapegoat. You are the same goat the entire game. Um, now, his little mouse friend does get new abilities. But is, are the abilities just based off of bubbles that show up on later levels or are abilities you can take back to old levels? No, no, it's just level specific. Yeah. That's what so I mean. In, in this world, he gets like a thing that lets him fly through like like walls. You know, or in this one, you get a thing that you can like recall him and throw him somewhere else. Yeah, so that's why that's another cool thing about Escape Goat is he's got a little mouse friend that helps you. Just he just runs along the wall, and then if he gets hit by something, he explodes and comes back to you. And then the wizard hat is how you switch back and forth with him. Yeah, I, I, the wizard hat does that. I think there's like a cape, and the cape is what like lets him fly through things and like destroy enemies. It's 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 really clever, and the whole thing has a really strangely enough, the whole game has a, like a religious bent to it. The funny thing, bent, could- but it's, it feels like they're in a church. And you're talking to the ghosts of these animals from the past, and they're all trying the to. The first one definitely oh, gets yeah. that vibe because because when you rescue the goat, when you rescue the sheep, they're on like like those like church pains. Yes. So yeah, all the sheep are asleep, and you're and you're waking them up, and you're waking them up to ascend to the top of the tower. It's just so bizarre, so funny. Uh, funny enough, this could also fall under which is a track I'm going to not a track, but it's a theme episode I refer to later in the show. Um, underrated Gems, which was episode 27-8. Oh, is that because, your next one? No, not my next one, but it's going to come up later. But I just wanted to mention it because this is an underrated gem, both the first game and the sequel. I, I 100% agree. I, I went back to look. I, when we had him on the show, I know he was working on a new project that was kind of related to like a tactical RPG and related to Gauntlet. And um, he's still working on games, it looks like, but I nothing new has been released. But if you're a solo developer, I'm sh- it must take a long time. So I think he worked a long time on the Escape Goat games. Yeah, which is sad, but also I'm just glad he was able to get them done because the world is a better place, even if slightly, for them existing. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that, that they exist, that he spent the time to write this music and he spent the time to make these games. Also, can yeah. I just take a second to reflect on the fact that the, the fact that his name is Magical Time Bean is just so whimsical and yes. wholesome? Yeah, I don't know where it came from. I don't think we ever asked him that. I just... His name's Ian. 
<laughs> <laughs> it's great. All right, so what, what is your next track? Okay, so my next track is in reference to this is one that might be this is a surprise one because it's not from an obscure game or an odd game or anything, but it is a track that comes to mind for me in odd places at odd times, and I was shocked to learn that we never played it on the show. So it fits in the come up now. This would be a tie back to episode 26-5, Mini Games Part 2 with Chell Wong, which by the way, congratulations, Chell, on both doing your, I think she's doing a game developers conference yeah, talk. Yeah, she, she's, doing a, she's doing a big um, talk at GDC on pretty much like how to, how to start in the industry. And if anyone's going to know like how to like really network and stuff, it's going to be her. It's going to be her, yeah, because yeah. she is a freaking Discord beast. Yeah, she's a powerhouse. So this track is called Deck Swab, and it is from the game Grandia, the first Grandia. And it's composed by Noriyuki Iwadare. Nice. Which could also tie back to the Noriyuki Iwadare episode <laughs> yeah. we did. Oh, we got, we got it both ways. That's right. Double Town! Welcome back. You are listening to Deck Swabbing from the game Grandia, released on the PlayStation, Saturn, and recently got re-released as a Grandia collection on like everything, so whatever. Um, composed by Noriyuki Iwadare. So, like I said, this track is one that kind of comes and goes in my life because it's a good one. It does. Like, it's a track... And the game itself, it plays as like a mini game track that happens when you're like when Justin's like working on a ship, okay. where he's made to like mop the ship as fast as he can. This is the this is the most lighthearted, you know, mopping a ship deck. <laughs> well, it's because Ever. this is the beginning of his adventure, and essentially oh, okay. he's like, "I'm going to do the best job of it." You'll see, and he's like going out there, he's like they're timing you for how fast you can clean the ship. Deck. This is so anime. This is this is anime theme song like territory we're in. Oh yeah, and I, and I love it. And I, I use this track for all kinds of things. Usually task oriented things like cleaning the kitchen, moving things like moving things from cabinet to shelves and stuff like that. You're like, oh man, I gotta do the dishes, and then in your brain it's like, as like hands are moving, you got the whole like bubble cloud that happens when people wash dishes and shows. That's funny. I I love this track. In fact, just I don't know. It makes me wonder how many tracks I've played from Grandi on this show because. The Grandia 1 and Grandia 2 OSTs, for that matter, are just phenomenal. Like, I, Noriki, these are the tracks that put um, Iwadari on the map for me, or from these two games. And I first played it as a Saturn release, because the Saturn one never came out in America. It was only in Japan. A friend of mine had, uh, he had the game in Japan, Japanese, but he also had this weird release that came out only in Japan. He had the mail order for it. It was like a bonus museum disc. And when you put it in your Saturn, it was a whole bonus dungeon. Oh, that yeah. You had like bosses that were hidden in there and tunnels, but the things you were unlocking by beating bosses and exploring was music and art, which is an actually amazing concept for a bonus disc. And it's a concept that, frankly, I wish more companies did stuff like that because that's the only time I've ever heard anything like that being done. We've had three, we played three tracks from Grandio One. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. Which means welcome number four. Yeah, and one of them was this one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, don't you do <laughs> was, that uh, to me. I looked. I no, looked. The last one was uh, on your, your Summer Games Challenge, apparently. Maybe yeah. that's what it was from then. Duel with Gadwin. 
That's you know what? That's probably why I picked this track in. Not just mini games part two, but also do with Gabby. Yeah. Anyway, the point is, the point is, you should do dishes to this. <laughs> if you once you hear this song, clean your clean your house. That's right. Just this, clean up. This is the kind of stuff that empowers a person to get clean, things done. Clean your mess. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, clean your mess. Yeah, clean it up. All right, I'm turning this track down. And we're going to get into the part of the show we call the bonus round. Bonus round. This is our 300th bonus round, Pernell. That's a lot of bonus rounds. That's the funny thing. That is one staple that was around the sh- from the very beginning of the show. And remember, was not. No, it was Bonus rounds, definitely. I not. was always like, what, what's going to make us different, Pernell? What's going to make us different? <laughs> is we're going to do arrangements and remixes and covers on the theme. And I th- I, th- I always like doing it because I always want to look for this stuff anyway. It's a lot of fun. The only thing is, for me... Sometimes it can be great and sometimes it can be nerve wracking yes. because when I, when usually when a topic hits, I come up with my list of tracks and then of those tracks, either one of them or a very specific one mm-hmm. has to be the one I find a cover for. And sometimes that ain't happening. <laughs> sometimes I'm digging. Sometimes I'll find a track that I really want to play on the show. And then I'll find a cover of it that I'm really good. And then I have to choose between the two. One must live. Yeah, one must One go. must die. All right. So my bonus round pick, Pernell, it was we end as we begin playing Persona 5. <laughs> He's at the end, guys. I'm at the end. So I'm. it doesn't matter. I've been talking about this game for a long time. I'm going to play some music from this game. This is from the J Music Ensemble, which we have, we've played on the show a number of times. I love, love these guys. They're so good. And in fact, there were a lot, there were a lot of tracks. I wasn't sure which one to pick from that they play. They had um, there's a bunch of jam sessions. They called it. This is jam session number five. Jam and, session number five. And oh, is that Mambo Five? It is. Get out of here! You're fired. <laughs> so fired. Soon to come, Mambo number six. Get out of, yeah. This is this is Mambo number one. Um, we're gonna listen to the track Price. We're gonna listen to the track Price. From the game Persona 5. I want to say this is from... Oh, Price is my baby. I know this track. Yeah, this is a good one. This is third. From, this is from the third palace. Yeah. Which palace was that again? Uh, the gangster guy. Gangster guy. That's in the, the bank. And this is amazing. This is um, composed by Shoji Maguro, arranged and performed by the J Music Ensemble.
That was the um, J Music Ensemble covering this song, Price, from Persona 5. Probably one of the best palace themes in the entire game, in my opinion. So I'm that was, and they did a fantastic job with it. I was like, we'll listen a little bit, maybe we'll skip ahead because it was pretty long. No, we listened to the whole the whole (laughs) thing, and it was worth it. That drummer, I don't know what your name is, guy, but you are a powerhouse. He is so 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 good. I really really enjoyed all of that. That was um, who's on the drums? Norman Edwards on the drums. Patrick, Patrick Bartley on the soprano sax, Chris Williams on the synths, um, Aaron Shapiro on guitar, Matt Wong on the keyboards, and Brad Miller on the bass. That is the J Music Ensemble. I know they sort of like um, certain members float in and out of that of that group, but it's it's pretty badass. Yeah, <laughs> Some was, good stuff. That was powerful. I'm glad you enjoyed that. So, Pernell, swinging it over to you, my friend. Well, my track won't be nearly as long as that, but <laughs> it does, that does not mean it's not good because this track, I've looped this multiple times. It's a very full feel-good tune in its original take, but in this take, it gets ramped up to like 11 for me. Um, this is based off of episode, well, I mentioned earlier, 27-8 Underrated Gems, and is one of my favorite games that's come out in the last like 10 years or so. Um, this is... Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom, a cover of the opening song, and it's titled Extreme Energy, covered by the band Holy Book of Wang. So you just listened to the extreme, it's called Extreme Energy, a cover to the opening song, Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom, done by a holy book of Wang. And uh, yeah, that to me is one of those, I feel like hot buttered crash today. I'm just not feeling so great. And somehow this song came on the radio and now I feel like I can do anything. It's just, it's a fantastic song, an uplifting song. A feel good in the morning, afternoon, night <laughs> song, and they did it justice on I top really, of justice. I really liked. It. I didn't know. I don't know the original song, but it's just really happy. It's really feel good. Actually, the last episode, not the last episode, but the one the the pirates versus ninjas episode, you played Maze theme from Guilty Gear Strive, mm-hmm. and that is a fun song. Yes, I'm like pronounced on a fun song kind of mood. When I can find them, I'm in. Like it's just <laughs> something about it. Like. I like my action tracks and I like my metal tunes. And honestly, that was rock. Um, mm. But there's just something to be said about a song that while you listen to it, you just, no matter where your mind is, You're you just, just can't help but be dragged kicking and streaming <laughs> into an upbeat state of mind. Totally. And this one is one of those tracks that has the capacity to do that for a person. Mm. It's well, been looped. <laughs> you just played it over and over. Mm. Yeah. Well, for more information on the bonus round, Go to rhythmandpixels.com. We'll have links to the J Music Ensemble. We'll have music uh, links to the music of the Holy Book of Wang and everywhere where you can get the music, buy the music, stream this music, and support these incredible artists. Right, 
Thanks for joining us on our 300th episode. This is 30 8, just our 300th episode. I, I realized our 200th episode we call the clip show. And I think I did a bunch of clips from previous episodes, and I did not take the time to do that this time. Life has been frantic <laughs> and manic in the last few, actually the whole month, really. So that totally makes sense. Yeah. But at the end of the day, clip shows, specialty things, drinking wine, all that's just fluff. At the end of the day, the show is about hanging out and playing mm-hmm. music. So totally, totally. Whatever. Um, we're ending on another little track from Persona 5, because why not? It's a good one. Because a fantastic OST. And you, you need to finish that game. I will. I but will. You're, you're there. Hey, I'll give you credit where it's due. Before, I gave you grief at a holiday party, and you got home and said, no more. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I played some more. Uh, but, <laughs> I played some more. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, but no, before 2022. You need, Yeah, you, got, you have about two weeks left. Okay, but New Year's Day. I want to hear that you didn't like New the ending. New Year's Day doesn't count. Actually, it's, I want to hear that you like the ending. But either also, way, <laughs> we could talk about the ending, though. <laughs> You're just like, just let me talk about the ending, Rob. Yeah. Come on, we could do it. <laughs> I want to hear your take on the ending. I think it'll be interesting. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Yeah, actually, yeah. I'll bring up one more thing because it ties into the fact that I totally screwed up the episode order. <laughs> uh, so during the time at PAX, I took a shot in the dark thanks to the suggestion of a friend who said, try to get a media pass. You never know. You might be able to go for free. And I did. So afterwards, I decided to lean into the role and start going up to booths and saying, hi, I'm from Rhythm and Pixels. We do VGM music and we also talk about things we like on the show. Yeah. And we like board games. And surprisingly a number of those companies said sure we would love for you to review some of our games here take some or here we'll mail you some so unexpectedly we are officially on the the board game review junket now what that means is not that we're doing anything like uh uh like uh, like the dice tower or something like that and we're not trying to we're not doing anything that's going to split our audience or anything like that but the idea that comes to mind however is we treat it just like we do anything else we talk about Mm. like on this show so it will be a segment called Board Game Beats in the event that we have a game that we want to talk about. It might be like a little like five, ten minute snippet during an episode where we just gab about a game we like. Yeah, it might just... All person will love it. Yeah. <laughs> one person will really love it. No. Oh, not one. Ulf person. Ulf, Ulf, Ulf person. Yeah, I thought you said one person. No, his name is Ulf person. Um, yeah, so it'll be kind of in the middle of an episode or the beginning and we'll just we'll kind of bring it up. Yeah, yeah, and I thought about like what I would do if I wanted to get nitty gritty deep into a game, and I think what that would end up being is like um, you suggested writing an article for like the Rhythm and Pixels website and slapping it there. Mm-hmm. I'd do that. I'd probably cross post it on Hey Poor Player, so it'd be like Pernell from Rhythm and Pixels here's a thingy, yeah. and carry the moniker Pixel Plays if I write it, and it'd be kind of cool just to be like just to kind of extend just the idea of what we do while also not changing what we do. Right. And you're probably going to want some um, additional players for to, to play test some of these games. So, Oh, God, I'm not playing these by myself. You're gonna have to bring, impossible. You're gonna, you have to bring a bunch of them over. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think it'll be fun. Like, it's... Because uh, I... I mean, I think you're the same way, too. It's one thing to just engage in a, a medium and then letting it go. That goes for anything. TV, video games, board games, cooking, any of that. It's one thing to engage it. It's another thing to engage in it and then discuss it and talk about it. There's there's something to be said about the feeling you get when you exchange ideas and feelings about a thing that you ultimately like, even if that specific aspect of it is something that you don't. It feels good, and I love to do it. Mm-hmm. It's why I was able to do SML for I think I've been on this show for like five years now. Wow. Like, and I never expected yeah, to I didn't be. I think I realized that you started it soon after you started this too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Christmas, like December 2016, I got my first review code and it was on a fluke because someone went to France. Oh, wow. And it was like, well, we need someone to cover this game. Do you want to do it? I was like, sure. And I've been doing it ever since. And then the Hey Poor Player kicked up a couple years after that. I've been doing that. It's like, I just like talking with my friends about cool stuff. And why not do it here? You're my best friend. We should be oh. talking about wacky sh- oh. stuff. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> wacky stuff. Oh, uh, man. That, well, Yoshi's making an appearance now. Oh, I don't my know what's, God. what's happening. That's what happens when I get excited about stuff, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. But the point is, the important part is, I think it's a great thing to do. And it's also why 
as you might notice, sometimes like on like the Discord chat, I might just chime in every once in a while. Goes, so what are you guys playing nowadays? Because even if I can't comment on the game someone's playing, I love hearing people tell me about the games yeah. they're playing. It just feels good to have that exchange. And in a world where we never have time, when there's never enough time, what's the best way to experience something that you don't have time for? Hmm. Have it explained to you by someone who had time for it. Yeah, hearing hearing the stories. That's right. The story about it. Well, if you have a story for us, this is a good segue. If you have a story for us, if you want to say hello, if you want to send us a track suggestion or a topic suggestion, please send us an email. Rhythmandpixels at hotmail.com. And if you'd like a full track listing of this episode um, or a full track listing of all of our episodes or access to all of our episodes, please go to the website. Rhythmandpixels.com. Um, and there you can just you can see all of the, all of the episodes that, that are missing off of the main feed because all the old stuff. Rhythm and Pixels Babies, all the, all the spinoff shows. Rhythm and Pixels Babies, and they p- make podcast <laughs> tunes. Rhythm and Pixels Kids, Rhythm and Pixels Junior. <laughs> um, Rhythm and Pixels Junior is is all, it's it's, it's just Nickelodeon based uh, Nick Junior games. Um, so you can go there. You can go to uh, youtube.com slash Rhythm and Pixels. We have a uh, 8-bit and 16-bit 24-7 classics radio station playing all the time until the computer explodes in my closet that will not stop playing so you can go check that out and if you want to support the show you can just uh you can subscribe to us you can hit the like button on youtube um or you can go to patreon patreon.com slash rhythm and pixels and as a member you get cool stuff like stickers or mugs or t-shirts um there's exclusive content uh, such as prequel episodes there is a monthly uh, live stream episode that we do Every month. Did I say monthly? Every month. Every month on a monthly basis. Monthly, exactly. Every month on the month. <laughs> um, so you can check that out at all at all levels. Um, you get access to that to at least that content. There. And if any of our patrons are listening to this point in the show, I think the topic we'd be doing for this month will be something akin to like gift giving, gift giving yeah. tracks you'd give to someone in your life or someone you care about or something you don't care about. I don't know. Yeah. Or just tracks that tie back to things that you cared about this year. Yeah. Well, well, um, well, what we like to do is announce what our Patreon episodes are going to be on Discord and on Facebook and on Twitter and all those places and Instagram, really. Um, and then you can uh, suggest tracks for that show. And that show is all listener suggested tracks. Exactly. You don't yeah. have to be a patron to submit a suggestion. Mm-hmm. So do it, do it, do it. I really enjoy doing that. And then at the end of every episode, we like to thank all of our members, uh, all the members at the highest levels of our Patreon. So we'd like to thank Frankly Zappa, Kristen, Mike Myers, Alf Person, Fashion 8060, Alex Messenger from A VGM Journey. Thank you so much. Uh, Andreas Milberg, Brian Pitt, Cameron Worma, Camille, Carlos, Kung Fu Carlito, uh, Chris Wisner, a.k.a. Musashi 219. Oh, by the way, he, I have to, we'll have to listen to the CD. He actually sent a gift. Oh. It, it was a really cool music CD. I can't remember the name of the group, but it's basically a OST of a band that played it for a would-be video game. Oh, fun. So we'll have to give that a listen. Yeah, I'll have to give that a spin. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank uh, Christopher Sendstrom, Davey Cakes, David Taylor, Harold Howard, Justin Schneider from XVGM Radio, Michael Bridgewater, Dr. Michael Bridgewater from the Forever Sound Version podcast. Congratulations. Um, nine out of 10 doctors agree. that That's a fantastic VGM podcast. That's that right. last doctor was wrong. That's the margin of error. <laughs> I'd like to thank Michael Jennings, Rage Cage, Reinhardt Selkova, Sleepy S'more, Steve Miller, Taco, The Autistic Gamer 89, and Ed Wilson from the VG Embassy. Thank you also for um, submitting that uh, little, little thank you words of wisdom. <laughs> silliness from you there at the beginning of the show um also i want to make a huge shout out to hammock at kvgm they celebrated uh their their first year of the last wave which has been a fantastic show the Um, weird part is you just said they're celebrating their first year it feels like it's been around longer wow i might be wrong they had a he hit a milestone and i'm really happy for him and i feel really bad that i can't remember (laughs) what it was i know you might be confusing it with daryl about um, basically the last Recon. He just hit a year milestone recently. Yeah. Yeah, I totally I totally screwed up. Anyway, you hit a milestone. I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Your new website looks really good. He's actually gone with hosting that we use as well. 
Um, so it's been great chatting with you about technical podcast stuff on Discord. He's just freaking awesome. Yeah, I love that show, man. So KVGM, The Last Wave, subscribe to it on subscribe to it on Apple or it's wherever, late. Spotify. Pumpkin Tongue. It's a podcast you should listen to. And if you don't listen to it, you're not my friend. Yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. You can become his friend by listening to <laughs> No, it goes both ways pretty much. <laughs> Just stop listening. Get out of my life. <laughs> it's too good. Uh, all right, thank you all so much for your continued support of the show. All that money goes back into the hosting. It goes back into the website. It goes back into um, equipment, software, all the stuff that is required for keeping the show running. And, you know, I do, uh, like, we, we record the show. It takes about two to three hours. Um, editing the show takes about one to two hours. Like all the work, it takes it takes a number of hours every week to, to get get this 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 level of quality for now. <laughs> now I don't know if I could talk that good. That's but, because it's late, though. but definitely can record okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I record good now. Everything's still running. Um, but anyway, thank you everybody again, and we'll see you on episode three hundred and one. We're still Next rolling. Week. Yeah. Next week, and um, yeah, I'd be, actually, we have to figure out recording times because we have some holidays coming up. Oh yeah, crap! It's Christmas next week. Yeah. Oh my god! And if you're listening to this episode, it's tomorrow. No. Merry gag, or well, either still Merry it's Christmas. Coming up. Yeah, it's coming up real soon, and then the New Year. So, um, and then Magfest is coming. Up. Are you coming to Magfest? I am. I have. I'm trying to figure out if I'm doing both days because I have to have two panels. Oh jeez, yeah. I I don't know if I'm comfortable with the crowds, so I'm not. I don't think I'm going to go. Um, I don't blame you, honestly. Mike, Mike's got spare. He's, he he actually rented a house down near there, and he's who he, did? Uh, Mike, Mikey. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And he had extra room. Oh, talk to him for me, because if he can help me out, that would save me a lot. Yeah, of I'll hook you up. Yeah, that would. That I think he'd love to have you. That'd be good. Yeah, because I got a panel on Friday and a panel on Saturday, and right now the concern is I might not be able to do the Friday one because I can't cover the. I can't afford to be staying down there overnight. Yeah, he said it's like a ten minute walk or something. So that's perfect. Yeah. Hey. hey. All right, so yeah, we'll see Pernell at Magfest. <laughs> I'll, I'll be at home. Chiller. Maybe I'll go next year. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like I said, I genuinely don't blame you in the least on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's how it goes. So anyway, thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next week. Cannot wait for 301. My name is Rob Nichols. And I'm Pernell. Have a good time. Have a good, t- have a good day. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> time. It just covers everything. That is true. And remember, so health is very important. There is also something that we generally tend to neglect either because, you know, we feel like we're young forever. We can do whatever the heck we want. We're superhuman. <laughs> um, and other times it's for a more unfortunate reason being that, you know, health care ain't friggin' cheap. It is not cheap. Trust me, I can tell you firsthand I've been dropping dollars left and right. But with that said, that just goes to show you that it's all that much more important to take care of yourself outside of the hospital, outside of your doctor's office, because... Uh, was it was like a penny for a pound or an apple a day? One of those words that keeps the doctor away. <laughs> you want to take care of yourself because yeah. if, even if you even if you're like kind of you know nonchalant about it and unconcerned, one thing we can all agree on: saving money is cool. <laughs> Not spending money on tr- medical treatments and medical tests is worth its weight in gold. Take care of yourself. Eat well. Lots of spinach and kale. Vitamin D. Video games because they're a lot. That'll always do you good. Um, and just be good to yourself because we want you, we want to keep you around as long as possible, hanging out and having fun with us. Yeah, get some vitamin D and take the games outside with you. Hey, that's what Nintendo Switch. And then you could do um, put it on the ground, and do push ups while you're doing the Nintendo Switch. If they if Nintendo that's what they did that they had the Wii Fit. You do the Wii Fit, yeah. And then um, after every uh, death in your game, ten squats. You joke, but I do that. <laughs> I should. I think I, I would be. I would be a king, a squat king. Also, that's why I don't play Dark Souls anymore. Because <laughs> my legs would be so torn up. <laughs>